Thank you, Sister Logan. Once again, we're going to consider some words of Jesus. This um, this time that um, the Lord's given me to look into the, His words have been very profitable to me, to my to my spirit, to be able to see the the perfection of Jesus' words, the accuracy, the preciseness with which Jesus speaks. Jesus doesn't speak anything just as an aside. You can take Jesus' words, and they're always right. They're always fitting. And as you meditate on them, they're, um, they'll enlarge in your understanding. They'll, they'll enlarge your understanding of who God is. And um, obviously, this is whom to know, speaking of God, is everlasting life. So... Um, Anytime that God is looms small in your thinking, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the doctrine. If, if what you're thinking about makes God smaller, it can't be right. He says here, we're looking into something that um, is kind of unique to Jesus. Jesus um, reveals to you what he's not going to pray for, um, which is harder. To take away man's sin or to keep him sinless in the midst of the enemy's camp. Now, I would suggest that both of these are impossible with men. And yet, you see, there's a demonstration going on here. Jesus knows. He knows all things. He knew everything that was going to come upon him. And he knows why he's praying this prayer. This isn't just this flowery word. This means something. This is going to... Um, going to definitely mean to, something to those who are kept from the evil. Uh -huh. Some people don't even know what's going on around them. They have no idea. But see, these people, these people, they're going to know what's going on. Amen. Jesus is praying for what he does not want to happen. Now the implication comes along with this that um, had, had he prayed that they be taken, they would have been taken. This is, Jesus has this kind of power. This is not just um, idle conjecture on my part. Remember Peter, remember when he cut off the high priest servant's ear in the garden there? Pulled out a sword. Of course, he wasn't Amos for his ear. You know that. He was going to do some damage to that man. And yet, Jesus says something here that, that gives you the idea, be able to process this in your understanding of the totality of the power that Jesus has. He says, put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? Don't you know that all I have to do is speak a word? And the whole world would disappear. But he, he gives you something to think about now. He says, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? Amen. That this, this, it must be. See, it, this, was, this was the time of darkness now. God had given over. See, the, God had, had, as it were, delivered Christ into Satan's hand. Do what you will. Let's see how this works out. Well, God already knew how it was going to work out, but Satan didn't know yet. Yeah. Satan didn't know that he's nailing his own nails on his own coffin. That through death, he was going to deliver them who all their lifetime were under fear of death. He was going to destroy him that had the power of death in death. I see, <laughs> only God can do this kind of stuff. Jesus is saying, I pray not that you take them out of the world. Now, remember another time he said, he said, I, I, I pray not for the world. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to see what Jesus doesn't pray for. Mm -hmm. Well, in light of this, now those who insist that Jesus, that Jesus and God can't do anything they want. See, they, they haven't really seen the whole picture. Jesus and God, they do their will. Now, um, what we're seeing in salvation is a working out or a demonstration of that will, God's eternal purpose, which if you can see it right, starts from Genesis, goes all the way to the book of the Revelation and passed into eternity when you see the perfect completion of the eternal purpose of God worked out. You'll see 
why every single person was left here until, until their time was complete, until God was ready, until they were mature and ready to be with him. Well then, the fact that God is pleased to work in, in this. Now look, think of this arrangement. How This is going to require God now to keep you in the enemy camp, take away your sins, give you a clean slate as it were, give you the Holy Spirit, give you the Word of God, give you the comfort to come along. But it's going to require God, going to require Jesus sitting on the throne, reigning, administering grace in order for you to be kept from the evil. So God's bringing himself into the equation. It's not just you're sitting out here on an island somewhere. Although John would tell you he can be kept on an island if, if, if that's what's required. But the point is, is that God put you in a body. Now, as you function in this body, you're going to get resources that are going to assist you in being kept from the evil. It is essential that you are kept from the evil. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. But, but wait a minute, Jesus, this is exactly what I want. Now, I don't know about you, but when I came into Christ, this really isn't what I wanted right then. <laughs> I would have been totally happy if it had just taken me right then. But you see, I was immature. I didn't understand. I didn't understand the implications of that desire. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay in the enemy's camp where you're constantly bombarded with, with wicked thoughts and, and, and the world around you that's constantly trying to lure you away. But see, what I didn't know is, is, the, is walking with Jesus. See, this, is, this, is far, this, is, this is a great thing to be able to participate in salvation, to be able to, for God to be able to reveal to you things that have to go. They really do have to go. But you didn't really know it at the time. He reveals it to you, and, and you get rid of it by his grace. But see, how would have you known that had you not been here being kept from the evil? If you look more closely into the heart and nature of the gospel, you'll find that it has very little to do with pleasing men. You come into the king, you say, oh, this is what I want. No, this is not right. It's what he wants. This, the main thing is not what you want in salvation. It's what God wants. Amen. And what you're getting in salvation is exactly what God wants. Amen. Now, see, he's bending your will. Actually, you, you find out that you, you can see God more clearly when you die to yourself. That's really when you start making some progress in the kingdom. And when you start dying to yourself and you take up your cross and you follow after him, now you're like in the camp where you can actually make some progress. Everyone who abides in Christ and walks in the spirit and lives by faith and is presently tasting of the powers of the world to come, they're crucifying the flesh, living unto God, they're putting on the whole armor of God, they're crucifying all the affections and lust, and they're partaking of the Holy Spirit. See, they're partaking of this divine nature. What's going on? They're being kept from the evil. So you see, it's, it's actually, it's rather indirect, this keeping. You, as you give yourself to God, you're kept from the evil. That's really the only way that he does this. See, otherwise, lifting you up out of the world and putting you in heaven would have been the answer. But this isn't the way God's done it. Plus, then some, somebody says something today made a lot of sense. If he did that to everyone, who would preach? <laughs> who would be around left to preach the gospel if you instantly just left? Salvation has been designed to produce these kinds of vessels. These vessels are being made fit. Which means that when you come in to Christ, what you are isn't what you're going to be at the end. You've got a good start. You've got a good beginning. But if you're not being transformed into the image of Christ, somewhere along the line, the work stopped, didn't it? Now, see, that, that's obviously, they would call that drawing back. That's what the apostle would call it. He said, but, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. See, this is not, we're active. We're, we're, we're pressing towards the mark. We're, we're walking in, in, in the spirit. We're, we're living by faith. See, all these things are a forward stance towards change. I'm, I'm being changed into the very image of Christ. Well, 
how do you do that? Well, you got to have some time to do that. You have to be left here, but you have to be kept from the evil. Now, unrest, anyone who's ever lived through a time of unrest knows you don't make a lot of progress. You can hold your ground. You can be kept from the evil. But see, this, this time of peace, we've been, we're very fortunate uh, in, in our present. I mean, there's a lot of distraction around us, but we've been given a space of time to make progress, to press on. Even though there's distractions around us, you, you press past the distraction and you get the good stuff. Salvation, we see more about God than about men. You look into salvation, and, and if, you, if you look into it, you're going to end up seeing more about Christ, more about God, more about what, what in the ages to come than, than you are about man. Man is a part of it, don't get me wrong. We're being saved, but we're being saved to know him. See, it's, it's, he's actually the point. We see more about Christ's life than about men's life. Yeah, that God's revealing that everything we need, he's put in Christ. Yeah. Now, how are you going to get it? You only have to be in Christ. Paul said, Paul said, it's all about me. No, that is what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Uh -huh. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Which means that some men, it is in vain. It was in vain. But see, Paul said, that's not me. What God gave me, it's working in me. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. Yeah. You know, how, how, did Paul, how did Paul run so fast? Paul wasn't the object of Paul. Christ was the object of Paul. And as, as, as that dominated his life, he was able to see, yet not I. But the grace of God that's working in me. And it seems to me that no real forward progress can occur until the yet not I stage has been entered into. Until you see, until you see that it's not about me. Yeah, you're involved, involved in it. You're the one that's going to be doing the walking, right? But see, the steps of a righteous are ordered by the Lord, right? You're the one that's going to have to do the walking. Well, see, they we're workers together with God in this. We're workers together. Salvation has to do with God's divine power producing eternal results in those who believe the record that he's made of his son. You believe the record? Well, that's good. But there's a lot of walking to do between here and glory. Why has God left you here? So you can do that walking. It's only as you, as you put your hand to the plow that you get anything done in the kingdom of God. you got to do it. Of course, his grace, Paul's this told us it's his grace that was working in him to will and to do of his good pleasure. These results do occur in men, but ultimately, ultimately the result is for Christ. It's not for you. Now, see, how do you fit that into a health and wealth doctrine? It, can't, it won't work. You just can't fit it in there. Wait a minute, I thought you were going to fill up my barns with all kind of good stuff. No. It the treasures Christ that all things were made by him and for him. That I, I pray not that you should take them out of the world. There's something, there's something in the world that I'm going to use to pull out things that are in them that can't get into heaven. There's some things in you, even when you're coming to Christ now, you, you, there are some things that have got to be modified. Otherwise, what's transformation all about? What does it mean? If there isn't something that's got to go and something that's got to, you've got to move into. Something's got to be added. Amen. Amen. What Jesus says here almost sounds on the surface to be self-defeating. I, I saved them, and yet I'm going to leave them in the world. See, on the surface, it sounds like, why would you do that? Well, you start digging into a little bit deeper. There's some work. There's some work that's got to be done on you. You're not ready yet. I know that because you're still here. If, you, if, if, if you'd, you've gone on now, I can say, well, he's passed over now. He's receiving his reward. What Jesus is doing, Jesus knows that, that, that the work needs to be done, and, and, and he knows what the world's for. See, it's, the world's, yeah, it's, it's, it's made by God. It's, a, it's been allowed to be in the condition that it's in for a reason. It's not out of control. It's not. 
I mean, when you start seeing the world is out of control, now somewhere along the line, you got to admit that God's not all powerful. I'm not prepared to do that. God's in control. And you can see this in every one of his proclamations has the fingerprint of God. He's able to do what he promised. Jesus taught, taught him earlier, this is what he said in John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So we conclude that those who God has given to Christ are not of this world. They've been taken out of the world in us. In, in, the, in the primary sense, See, God took them out of the world, gave them the Christ. So even though you're in the world, you're not of the world. That's how you can be kept from the evil that's in the world. Amen. It, 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 it's, it's just foolishness to think that God's going to keep anyone from the evil that is a part of the world. This is just foolishness on the part of man. To think that I can be involved in the world, that I can be currently in the process of sinning, and then expect God to keep me from the evil. This is foolishness. Amen. Can't happen. you got to be separate from the world Amen. if you're going to be a, even a candidate to be kept from the evil. Amen. We then are the chosen out of the world to stay in the world for a season. Now think about that. Uh, on the surface, it sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? And yet, this is exactly the arena where God's getting him much glory. Think about it. He saves you out of the world, leaves you in the world, and then he proves your dominance. He actually proves it. The principalities and powers in heavenly places are looking down there saying, Wow, look at that. Look at, look at this servant. He, we know how weak he is. Remember what he used to be? Remember what he was before? Before? Remember he did say such were some of you. But look at him now. Look at what God, look at the grace of God's working in this servant. In other words, if all those who God had given to Christ were ever to leave this world, there wouldn't be a reason for this world. There wouldn't be one reason you could come up with why this world should possibly exist if you take away the saints. I pray not that you'd take them out of the world. That'd be the end of the world. Isn't that what's going to happen at the end of the world? He's going to take them all out then. But that you keep them from the evil. Now, there's a work that's being done in those who God's taken out of the world, and it requires their mortal bodies to continue to reside in the world. <coughs> Paul said it like this. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, you know, I, you think about putting your, yourself in Paul's shoes here. Paul realized that the only reason why I'm here is for you. It's what, it's what Paul realized. Uh, it's to, for me to die and to, to, to go on to be with the Lord, all oh, this is far better. For Paul. For Paul. Paul realized for me, this would be far better. But I'm not living for me. I'm living for Christ, and it would be better for you if I stay. Now, I know we have all witnessed an example of this just here recently. You know we have. There was a member of our assembly that it would be far better for them to go on. But God allowed them to stay here with us for a little while longer. A little while longer. Why, why, why was that person willing to do that? Because they weren't living for them. They were living for Christ, and it would be far better. And everyone here could testify that it's far better that the Lord did this for us. We're better off. Why does God do this? Because God's concerned with the body. God's doing a work. God's not just it's doing hit and miss work here. He's looking at the whole picture, and God's working all things according to the counsel of his own will to grow up, mature, many sons in the glory. And he's doing it in the midst of the enemy camp. Talk about the biggest, the biggest insult to Satan is to leave his people here and they flourish in the enemy's camp. This is, you know, <laughs> it shows you how actually how weak Satan really is. In the end, you're going to look at him narrowly and you'll say, is this the one? Is this the one that weakened the nation? So we'll look at him narrowly. He'll be cast to the sides of the pit then. 
He won't be the foremost personality in hell, you know. Now it's just for a season he's been given power for a season, but then it's going to be removed, stripped from him. He's going to be cast to the sides of the pit, and he's just going to be another one of those other ones who didn't do the will of God. Paul reveals the nature of this servanthood that he had. He said, I am in a strait betwixt two. Paul had to wrestle with this desire to go on to be with the Lord. He had a great desire. He loved the Lord. He had seen more of the Lord than any man that I know of. He, he, he had seen revelations. He said, I've seen so much I can't even tell you about it. I can't even put it into words. He had this great desire to be with the Lord, to be present with him, not be separated by, by time and space anymore. But it's what he said, and to be with Christ, and to be with Christ. He said, it's far better, it's far better. And there was not anything wrong with this desire. You didn't hear a boom out of heaven say, Paul, you shouldn't be so selfish. You can't be selfish and have a love for Christ. It doesn't promote selfishness. It's just foolish. Paul loved, loved Christ and he wanted to be with him. Paul wanting to depart and be present with the Lord, he even said that this would be far better. He didn't say this is a selfish desire. It's far better. Well, believe me, when you get to the point to where you want to be with Christ more than you want to be with anybody else, it's far better. You'll be a far better person to me and to God. It works far better things in you. But we see that Paul knew that the far better would have been for him alone. It wouldn't have been far better for the saints on the earth, would it? It wouldn't have. And Paul knew that. Nevertheless, he said, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He didn't say it's more needful for me. Remember when Paul was getting ready, he said, I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready to be offered. No, I could go right now. I'm ready. Remember, I'm commenting on the fact that God's left us here in this world for a reason. Uh -huh. The example that Paul's left us is that he was left here for a reason. It wasn't just, well, you know, maybe in a little while. He knew exactly what was going on. I'm staying here. In fact, my, my desire is to stay here for you. Well, I tell you, this is... This is until a, a, a minister of the Lord comes to this point, it's highly questionable whether or not he should be a minister. Until a person sees the flock as the flock of God and he lays down his life for the brethren, how can you really trust what he's going to say to you? If you're not, if your interest isn't at his heart, if he doesn't want to do you good and feed the sheep, his desire, I know a lot of shepherds, I hear them on the radio, that all they want to do is take things from the people. This actually is the nature of all new life in Christ. It wants to do God's will in the midst of the earth. As long as I'm here, as long as he gives me breath, you want to do what God wants you to do, what God needs done in the body. We're seeing here what happens when this is an example of letting brother love, brotherly love continue. Paul's love for the brethren exceeded his love for himself. Amen. The true under shepherds always consider the sheep before their own needs. This is what happens. The fact that this is lacking in so many so-called teachers and preachers, well, that's alarming to say the least. Paul could see that the real benefits would be had if he remained with the brethren. He's talking about the benefits for the brethren, for them. Paul had give, been given a, a revelation that only he had been given. And, and this, this, you know, this had to be spoken. It had, look at all the letters that he wrote. Everything that he's given us all the way up to this time. God worked in Paul. His grace worked in him for us. We're, this, we're some of the brethren that he was talking about. In other words, Paul could, his faith enabled him to be able to see past the moment, the here and now. He saw past that to what would happen, what would occur, the benefits that the body would be, would be enjoying if he stayed. So he's, I'll stay. 
Well, does it sound a lot like Jesus? A lot like his spirit. I'll come down. I'll take away sin, Father, so I can bring him to you. See, this is, this is the nature of spiritual life. We've been given to see these things in our own assembly to some degree. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Earlier I asked the question, which is better? To take away man's sin, or which is harder actually? To take away man's sin, or to keep him sinless in the midst of the enemy camp? Now in this fact that God is working in his people in the midst of the enemies, it's is extraordinary. Only God can do this. I know I've already said this, but keeping them from the evil, this is, this, this requires God to be in the picture. Now, if anyone doubts uh, the, the, the extremeness of Satan's hatred, if anyone would ever doubt that, just turn to the first chapter of Job. Just reread that. If anyone doubts that if Satan's given any, any leeway at all against you, well, will, will Satan ever have mercy? You think Satan could ever be merciful? You just read the first, first couple chapters of Job and you see as soon, the instant that Satan got any leeway against Job, instantly he worked, didn't he? He didn't have any mercy at all. Satan's not a good guy. Satan doesn't have any good in him. Satan's evil. He's wicked. In fact, he's the father of the lie, isn't he? He's a, all it takes is for God to give him a little bit of space and instantly he moves right into that. And he works whatever he can, he can work against the saints of the Most High God. Amen. Satan's our enemy. And uh, this is, you're in his camp. He's the prince of power of the air. You think you could survive here one instant without Christ? No. Wouldn't happen. Nobody who's born of Adam has an old man until such time they have a new man. Now, why is I bring this up? Because see, this is why this is the condition that God leaves you in. And this, He's done this on purpose. He's regenerated you, right? You've been born again, but you still have the old man. Now you have this old man inside of you. That's, see, we have an enemy from the outside, but we have an enemy on the inside that Satan can work with. It's an old man. He's corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Which means he's never going to want to do anything except bad things. The flesh is never going to want to do good things. Never, never, never. It's always going to want to do bad things. Now, I wrote a little bit of this online, but it really blessed my heart to think about this again. We were sitting at an agape dinner. Brother Fred started talking about the old man. And I was just a child. And he was talking about how much he hated. Now, I didn't see Brother Fred a lot during that time because he went to a different assembly, but he came over for agape. He's talking about how much he hated this old man. And then the rest of the brethren chimed in, and they were talking about how much they hated the old man. And I thought, I don't know who this old man is, but they don't like him at all. They're, they're against this old man. I don't know what this old man's done, but I've never seen these brethren act like this before. These gentle brethren... It's like they would like to take this. In fact, they even mentioned that they were crucifying this old man. They were putting him to death. I thought, well, this, is, this, is, this was so extraordinary to me, I just couldn't believe it. Of course, after a few years in the kingdom, I've come to hate this old man too. This, this old man's never going to change. He's always going to be... He's always going to be Hateful and, and lying and deceitful. Why? Because he's, he's of the earth, earthy. Amen. That's right. he's, he's to be greatly. It's his only one thing to do with this. It's crucify the flesh Amen. with the affections and lust. Regeneration and reconciliation and salvation all have to do with the divine nature of Christ impacting those who were dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, we have an, a side of our nature our old man, that's corrupt. Never going to be anything but corrupt. It's corrupt. It's got to be killed. Now, until this happens, no, no life on the new side is going to happen. 
You're not going to make any advancements with Christ as long as the old man's allowed to express himself. And anybody who thinks you can, they're just foolish. They don't know what they're talking about. Amen. Both of these natures cannot be operating at the same time. One's got to be killed in order for the other one to work. Now, need I say it, but if the old man's allowed to dominate, the new man's going to go into the background. He's, he's, he's just not going to be working. All psychological approaches to salvation attempt to fix up the old. That's what they're due. That's what their job is. They, they use a psychological approach to try to address Adam. Well, no thank you. Adam's on the cross. And I, quite frankly, don't want to get his attention. I have nothing to say to him. I have nothing to do with him. He has never done anything but evil to me, and I don't even want to talk to him. Yes. He can just sit there or lie there, be on the cross, and be silent because I got nothing good to say to him. One of these days, I, I, I keep telling him this, I'm going to be separated from you, and you cannot get in. You've got to stay behind. You are of the earth earthy, and you're going back to the earth. Amen. I'll have nothing to do with you anymore. I filed for divorce and there's a separation in place now and one of these days is going to be consummated and I'm not going to have to be around anymore. Amen. God has no benefits to offer Adam. None at all. No benefits. All the benefits are to the new man which are created in true holiness and righteousness. Now see this new man, if you give him your ear, if you allow this new man to dominate... There will be nothing but the blessings of God on your life. Amen. You will experience joy in the Holy Spirit. You'll walk in the Spirit. And you'll have no confidence in the flesh. This is all. But see, how would you know this if he didn't ha wouldn't have left you in the world? How would you know any of this existed? How would you be able to participate in overcoming if he had taken you out the moment you came in? But see, Jesus said... I pray not that you take them out of the world. See, this is not the objective. This is not the end all for you to be taken away from, from the strife. It's for you to be able to manage, see, to be able for you to walk in the spirit in the midst of this. And what happens? You see, what God's put in me is greater than what's in the world. Now, when you learn that lesson, now you can be more than conquerors through him that loved you. God isn't transforming Adam at all. See, there isn't even one bit of Adam that God's working with in salvation. All of it is like a residue that's soon to vanish away. But it is a residue. It is there. And for us to ignore it, well, this is not right either. To just say, I don't have to do, work. I don't have to do anything with you. Oh, no, you've got to keep it on the cross. If God were to salvage the souls of men, then his salvation must deal with the extraction of the old Adamic nature from the soul of man. That's got to happen. I mean, in other words, said, remember he said the word of God is, is sharper than, two -ed, two, than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder the soul and the spirit, right? Well, this old spirit that used to dominate you, there's a lot of things hanging around, a lot of things that it's impacted, the way you think, the way you, the way you live. It's a lot of things that, that you don't even know are there. But you stay in the world, you walk with Christ, and you'll start seeing things. I didn't know that this, I didn't know that this was dragging me down. I didn't have any idea at all, but now the Holy Spirit's illuminated it, and now with, with the, by the grace of God, you're able to distance yourself or cut it away. How is that possible? Because you have a new man. Yes, new man, it has the power to dominate the old. But, but the problem is when you came in, you didn't see the big picture. You didn't see all of it. Actually, it would be quite, it would kind of take your breath, wouldn't it? If the moment you came in, God showed you every single thing that was wrong with you, I don't know, it might be so discouraging, you'd quit right there. God shows you what you can handle. And as you can handle more, he opens up more to you. This is why he's left us here. God hasn't abandoned us. He's come to us. He said, I, 
I won't abandon you. He's come and he's made his abode in us. This is how these changes can occur. God's with us. If this extraction must be, this extraction must be complete and thorough, every vestige of Adam must be expunged from the individual if they are to one day be found welcome in the presence of God. There can't be even one cent of Adam on you if you're going to stand in the presence of God. Can't happen. Now, I'm talking now when you see him face to face. You're going to, God himself is going to be with his people. God himself. Well, now, on that day, you can't be having lingering things of Adam hanging around. Flesh can't inherit the kingdom of God. It can't. Well, this is God showing us this now. He's, he's working these things out to where you, of voluntarily, by the way, see, as, as this new man, he's quite a violent character if you get to know him. He, he'll, he'll rise up and kill the affections and lust of, he'll do it. You just keep feeding him, walking in the spirit, and the, the new man will just rise up and slay this old man. I like this. There's much more to being kept from evil than merely being kept from the lust of the flesh. See that Jesus didn't have, Jesus never lusted after a woman. This, this is just beyond comprehension to think that Jesus was down here in the mire. mire. No, this is not Jesus' nature. Look at the temptations that Jesus had. They were of a completely different nature than what the ones that the sons of Adam had. Yeah. We come into Christ. Now, these, these distinctions that I'm talking about, they're very fine. They're very fine. Sometimes it just may be a thought. Maybe it's just a, maybe that it's not sin at all. It's just something that distracts, something that would take you away. In other words, what God wants to work in you can't be done with this competing interest. But see, this is how fine of a line that, that the Holy Spirit will draw for you if you walk in the Spirit. But see, Jesus' temptations had more to do with his will, with his, you, are you going to choose you, your own, or are you going to choose God? And in the garden, we know. He said, he chose God. That's what Jesus chose. It cost him his life to do it, but then again, it's going to cost you yours too, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to cost you your life. But if you're willing to do it, well, then God will show you the highway. Amen. There are greater evils than being involved in the baser sins of immor immor immorality. See, there's greater evils than this. It may seem like this is the greatest evil to be, to be found with another man's wife. This is not the greatest evil. To, to be walking in any kind of unbelief where you don't believe God? See, when you come into the kingdom, all these things, all these things fall off right now. Amen. Right now, these things go. You're not going to be wrestling with fornication for a long, long time. If you are, then there's a big question whether or not you're in the kingdom of God. Yeah. See, you come into Christ and these things, these things, are, these things that you do, they're, they're done with. They're done. See, the, 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 all things are new. Amen. That's what he's talking about. But you're not done yet now. This is, you're not done yet. When a person begins his journey with Christ, they're delivered from all manners of evil right then. The whole, the, you know, the evil spirits, they can't come in and, and live in you anymore. You know, there was a time when they could. Yeah. The time before you had the Holy Spirit. They could come and they could have their way with you. See, well, I don't, know, I don't know why he did that. I can tell you why he did it. I can tell you exactly why he did it. Because the, 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 the spirit that's now working in the children of disobedience was working in you. And you did things that you, you can't even explain why you did them. But now you've come into Christ. See, now there's no room for those anymore. There's no way they can inhabit you now because the Holy Spirit's there. But see, well, the Holy Spirit's not just there for that, the Holy Spirit's there to reveal, to open up the things that belong to you. There are things that belong to you. Maybe you just haven't been using them. The Holy Spirit will show them to you. He'll point them out. Lead you in the way that is right. Amen. Paul discloses the manner of 
or, or nature of this salvation, 1 Corinthians 6, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, you know, I believe that that's just exactly the way it is. I, I just think that, that, that this is the unrighteous shall not inherit it. Now, if they say, I'm, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm unrighteous. Well, you know, they just lied, that's all. Because unrighteous, they, 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 they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They don't have everlasting life abiding in them. It's just foolishness. Now, if this one point could be seen clearly in the masses of people who flock to church buildings every week, that was, this would change the face of church overnight. Amen. It would change it. If people just believe this one thing, that I can't be unrighteous and be connected with God. It can't do it. Something's got to happen if I'm going to be connected with God. I've got to be made holy. Amen. Only Christ can do that, and he does it. Uh, this truth... It's got to be seen and seen clearly before anyone's ever going to see a need for Jesus. Until you see that every bit of unrighteousness can disconnects you from God, well, then what do you need Jesus for? If I can come to God and still be unrighteous, then what do I need Jesus for? But see, the fact is, is that I can't. And so now Jesus, he's high on my priority list. He can take away your sin. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If any man, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to ignore it? No. To forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Why? So you can be with God. Now that you can be with God, some changes are going to start taking place. And these are profound, eternal changes. These are not a temporary. It's not like I'm going to get a bigger car. What does that mean in the, in the course of eternity? These changes that the Holy Spirit's doing, it's for eternity. Amen. Actually, it won't be fully realized until you get there. Then you'll look back and you'll say, oh, I'm so glad that you took that away. Yeah. Oh, that, that, I can see it for what it really is now. That was deceitful. The only way for this message to be covered up that I'm talking about is through deception. Satan comes along, and what does he do? He says, it's okay. You, you will not surely die. It's okay. You know, let me talk to you for a few minutes about the love of God. And what do they do? They dis, disarms, takes the swords out of the saints' hands. They start laying, they start beating their swords into plowshares while they're in the enemy's camp. Oh, that's a bad thing. That's wrong. You're going to fall. Brother Aaron told us today about a scenario about a soldier sitting in the middle of a battlefield, just sitting down without his armor on, no sword. Well, you know, you can do that, but just not for very long. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It can't happen. So what has to happen if you're going to? Well, you have to be changed. You can't be that anymore. You have to get out of that category if you're going to be with God. Because God... It's not, none of these are going to be in glory. None of them. It can't inherit the kingdom of God. Well, there's not even one of these kinds of people, not even one. In fact, if there were, Jesus would have to leave, wouldn't he? Because then there would be no need for Jesus. But see, Jesus is there for a very real reason. He takes away sin. And he cleanses you for the Father. Now, hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Oh, do you want to kind of get familiar with God? He's merciful and gracious. And anybody who's serious will admit it. I need mercy and I need grace. Exactly what I need is what God is. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Now, if you're going to partake of any of God's grace 
and mercy, you got to get out of this category of sin. It's got to happen. You cannot be guilty and get God's grace. What are you going to do? Well, we have a great high priest, and he's able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. If you hate sin, he'll bring you into glory. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, see, he's taken away sin, and if if you believe the record that God's given of his son, he'll impart to you everlasting life. He'll do it. We have a great savior. Now, why I'm talking about now why God's left you here. These things, when you come into the kingdom, did you see all the ramifications of salvation? Did you see all the intricacies of what God's done in Christ Jesus and all the, all the effects of propitiation and all the, the wonderful glories of the mercy and grace of God? You just saw, I need my sin gone. And yet he's left you here. He's worked in you the whole time to bring you to a mature person to where you can handle salvation. You can handle understanding of God and you can become Actually, it's all ante room right now. It's all, it's all preliminary work to get you to the point to where when you get there, you'll know who you're looking at. Yeah. How is man ever going to be saved from such a heavy weight of sin? Now, everyone that knows that they're a sinner knows of the weight. There's, if, you, if you come in contact with, with the understanding, you know I'm a sinner and that I'm going to hell. Paul says, and such were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus is asking the Father to complete the work. See, Taking them out pre 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 preliminary, the work would not be completed. He's, don't take them out of the world. Keep them from the evil. Yeah, this, you say, this, is, this is the plan. This is what God's doing. Those who are being kept from the evil are involved in the process. They're not just being kept just like, like the rain falling and hitting on your head. You have nothing to do with it. No. You're involved in this. It's God that's working in you, but he is working in you. You're the one that he's working in. When the fruits of salvation, righteousness, and true holiness are being realized in the believer, they have abilities that others do not. Yeah. Now this, on one hand, is going to be something that you're going to be judged for, right? Yeah. To them who knew what the master wanted and didn't do it, they'll be beaten with many stripes. The very fact that you, you have a even if it's just preliminary, understanding of what God's doing in salvation, you can be a great asset in the hands of God. Okay, you understand what God, God's eternal purpose? Well, then I would suggest you say a lot. Speak a lot. Tell us, tell us what you've seen when you were in the holy place. Talk about it. We need to hear it. Amen. When you see sin the way Jesus done, Jesus does what happens. Sin becomes exceeding sinful. You see, this is, you, see, you respond like Joseph, how can I do this great evil and sin against my God? This is what happens when you start seeing, when you start living in the presence of God. And that happens when you're here. God's very merciful in giving us time with Jesus. Isn't that a merciful thing? <clears throat> he, bring, he pulls us out of the world, puts us in Christ, and gives us time with Jesus. Oh, this is a blessed thing. It's a very merciful thing. Because, you know, eventually, we're all going to stand before God. This is going to happen, whether, whether we're ready or not. We're all going to stand before God and give an account of the deeds done in the body. But well, now, as you are familiar with that now, you see how that impacts your life? It, 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 now you... You're walking with Jesus. You're making preparations for this day. It's coming. I'm going to stand before God. Well, now that impacts everything you do, every, everything you get involved in. It's in. Well, I know I'm going to stand before God. So now I'll handle myself differently than I would have had I not known that. And you have the resources. 
See, all the resources are in Christ Jesus exactly where God put you. And so you have this ability that people outside of Christ, they don't even have this ability. They may call themselves Christian. They may all come to a building once a week. They may talk about a lot of things and hold their hands up high. But if they're not being conformed to the image of Christ, one day it's going to be a severe wake-up call. It's like, what was I doing? Amen. But God's very merciful. Be sure of this. When we stand there, if you've been conformed into his image, you'll be very glad on that day. Yeah. <laughs> this will be... This is would be the greatest day that you ever lived. You stand before him complete, complete and perfect without any spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You'll stand before him and you'll say, here am I. I'm, I'm ready now, Father. You've made me ready. And you'll cast your crown at his feet. He's the one that made me ready, Father. Got me ready for this day. How is this possible? Jesus, kind of he, two things, he gives the Father a reason to answer this, and it's, it's the whole reason that it's possible. It says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, when you, when you get this in your, in, in, and you see it clearly, it will dominate the way you think. Mm -hmm. I'm not of the world. Satan will try to assault you with things, no, that, that's for worldly people. I'm not of this world. This is, a, Satan doesn't want, this is one of those things Satan doesn't want anybody to know about. But there are some people that are chosen of God that are not of this world. Now, this will be perfectly manifested one day when the world disappears. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to just vanish away like smoke. Where are you going to be then? Well, if you're not of the world, you'll be with God. See, if you're of the world, then you'll vanish with the world. See, there, there's, a, there's a place for those who are of the world, and it's not with God. It is though Jesus is appealing to God in a full accordance with his eternal purpose. Now, that's a good way to pray, isn't it? You pray to God in accordance with what he's already doing, his eternal purpose. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. Now, you know, it doesn't, it's not so bad to have to stay here if you're kept from the evil. Jesus is able to lay the whole weight of this request on the fact that they are not of the world. Well... I thank God for giving, giving us these words. These words, see, these, these are empowering. These words will empower you. There are some things that you're going to have to go through. There are some things that we're all going to have to go through. Known unto God are all his works, but we haven't seen it all exactly yet. We're walking by faith, not by sight. But as these words permeate your mind and your spirit, see, the, you're able then, you're, you're, you're equipped for the battle, and you say, well... In due time. See, he's going to come. Christ is going to come in due time. Until then, we labor until he comes. Yeah. Thank you.